Hey, everybody. Uh, sorry for running a little bit late. We're all juggling kids and things on the backgrounds here. Um, yeah, let's get started. I think we already have uh, the cohorts in place. And I'm also seeing, hey, Emmanuel. Uh, do you know if Lee was able to join Emmanuel? Hey, perfect. Good to see you both. Um, OK, so I think we will. Uh, uh, start. Uh, one of the threads that I wanted to follow up today is going to be the uh, case study number three. And we're going to flip a little bit in this context where we will talk a lot more about the problem first before we get in into the technology space. Uh, but before that, uh, I just want to get a show of hands, uh, just like we did last time, uh, of how many people at this point have joined Teams. So that Tyler, then this weekend, we can really try to help and make sure if folks are not in a team. Um, is there a way to do a poll or a percentage or somehow for at least the folks that are in there? I don't know, Tyler, if you can do a count. Uh, yeah, I think I can. Yeah, so we're currently, I think we're still waiting on people to. Could you please raise your hands. hand? The function is if you go in participants, uh is that correct how do i raise my hand? yeah that's right so under participants there should be a, a place you can raise your hand um looks like we're around half of the people that are here so far have a little bit more than half are raising their hands for um having joined a team um yeah w one quick thing uh for everyone um this is not something to worry about just yet but we're in progress uh the amazing logistics crew that's offered to help out with this has been setting up private Discord channels for each team. Um, these are not going to be like finalized finalized until the teams are formed. Manu, we can set a, a date for that when we want to have the absolute final team deadline. Um, but in the meantime, you can expect, if you have put your name on a team, you can expect to see that Discord channel appearing uh, pretty soon. Um, and at that time, you'll be able to sort of communicate with your team members directly in that channel. Mm -hmm. And then let's make sure that the mentors, Tyler, get to see all the team channels. Because as yet, what I'm, the, the logistics and the planning will be is once the teams are formed, uh, I'll break those teams down by function and then try to do some load balancing with the mentors as well. That's right. We're, we're going to do a little bit of a slightly different approach so that the mentors aren't swamped. Currently, the Discord looks insane uh, for the people that have admin access, but uh, we will make that work. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, let's dive in into today's class. Uh, and I think uh, I just want to, just as a tradition, for any new mentors uh, that have joined but have not had the chance to introduce themselves in the past. Actually, we do have Lee. So since, uh, Lee, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, Tyler, do you want to unmute Emmanuel's channel? And actually, you should just uh, unmute Emmanuel's channel because uh, Perfect. Uh, they'll be presenting today. Yeah. Oh, you're still muted. Please. Okay. Now you can. Yeah. I don't know ah. about mentor, but I'm just joining for today and then we'll see how yeah. it goes. But, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but my name is Lee Carbos. I'm also at the University of Maine and I'm an oceanographer, a biological oceanographer. I'm studying phytoplankton in the ocean and um, um, looking at diverse type of questions related to changes both in biomass and the composition, taxonomic composition of phytoplankton at diverse environments in the ocean. Emmanuel will talk about it uh, shortly. And um, I'm here today because we are starting a new program in the Arctic that I think uh, links very well with some of the things that you are doing here. And I uh, will present it later. Um, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think so. The the reason uh, both Lee is joining and my hope is that eventually if people get excited about the community and the challenges that she's about to share that will kind of have her uh, be able to mentor some of the teams in that space as well. Uh, so today's topic uh, for the class is uh, measurements at planetary scale and we will choose one ecosystem that we will talk about and then in the next class we will choose another ecosystem um, and one of the perspectives that I want to take today is why the approach of frugal science is really well suited 
to making measurements at planetary scale. And then we will spend a lot of time, uh, Emmanuel and Lee will talk a lot about one ecosystem. Uh, so I think let's get started because I want to have lots of time for discussions. So Emmanuel, I'm gonna take uh, maybe 10 minutes to define the history of citizen science briefly and then pass on to you. We could also do it the other way around. Uh, so which way, actually, why don't we do it the other way around? Okay. Let's, let's introduce the ecosystem first. So let me just share my screen and just show one slide for a second. Uh, and so the topic for today is really measuring the planet. And I think there are certain sets of principles and I'll bring this up back again that we want to talk about. Uh, but the goal for this is to be thinking about when you look at the planet, what are the sets of principles that you want to think about in your measurement technologies? Uh, and I think we will first talk about why it's important to measure the planet and why the health of the planet is as important and is deeply linked with our own health, for example, but does not get the same uh, uh, weight. And then of course, uh, as Emmanuel is talking about, I want all of you to be thinking about what does it mean to create inclusive environments for collaborators, especially between people who would call themselves as professional scientists, as many of you might be, but also as citizens. And this is sort of the heart of the challenge associated with what we are about to talk about. So let's transition to Emmanuel. Do you want to share from your side or? Yeah, I, I change a tiny bit, but I, I change. So you'll have to let me, you'll have to share your screen yeah. with me. So Tyler, can you enable and make Emmanuel the host? And then you can just share now. Okay, uh, let's see if I can find the PowerPoint. Yes, I can. I think it'll be easier because you'll be able to move back and forth. And then before you start, Emmanuel, you should just also do a one line intro for yourself yet yeah, again. That's yeah. not the one I wanted. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Did I lose my. Uh... You, you can take your time. It's, uh, I also have that file I can send you a link to. No, no I, I have the file on my. I'm just trying to see. There's too many uh, files. Just, <laughs> <laughs> too many files open in the same time. I think it's. This one, yes, okay. Um, so you, okay, perfect, and I'll start it. So um, Manu asked me yesterday to give you oh, a- Manuel, little... can you change, just sorry to interrupt. Can yeah. you switch the viewer mode? What we are seeing is your notes mode. Oh, and sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. If you, I think if you mirror, mirror displays or something. Oh, so. Okay, let's try again. Uh, you have to do the display. Um, the dis Lee says I have to change it in the display. I don't know where. Uh, or when you do this, this is better. That's perfect. Okay. That is perfect. Yes. Thanks. Okay, so um, um, this is what uh, my task was uh, from Manu yesterday to try and introduce you to you know, some concepts that have to do with the ocean, relationship to health, how we measure them, uh, what are we doing with these measurements, and, and then try and dive into one group of people, in this case we'll drive into the Arctic, that are communities that are strongly affected by what's happening in the ocean. Um, we are monitoring, somebody monitors the chat, so feel free. I, I cannot see the chat from here, but if, uh, uh, please Manu, if there's a question, by we'll do. please interrupt if there's a need. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I'll monitor the chat as well. Okay, so this is a, a you know, bullet thing that Noah puts out there to describe why, what are the kind of services, that's just the, the buzzword it's now given, that the ocean provides humanity. So, the ocean is a huge buffer. It takes about 40% of the CO2 we, we're pumping into the atmosphere in a crazy rate. Uh, it's also uh, mitigating a lot of the heat uh, due to climate change. Um, it, uh, every second molecule of oxygen that you breathe came from the ocean, from this tiny plankton, phytoplankton that we talk about. A lot of transportation uses the ocean uh, to take a lot of the goods that you, you currently have in your hands and otherwise. 
Many of us uh, use the ocean for recreation. About half of humanity lives within 200 miles of, of the coast. Um, but, and, and therefore, there's a lot of uh, economy that goes with it and food. And food is everything from you know, the fish, which is easiest to think about in aquaculture. But there's also a lot of product that are taken out of algae uh, and microalgae that, are, that end up being parts of the food you eat. And finally, medicine, but if you ever used uh, green fluorescent protein, many of you have, that was something that was discovered in the ocean. And it's a fascinating story to read uh, if ever you have the time about, about the, how they discovered that. Um, in terms of pollution, what we're giving the ocean. So one, there's, there's a whole variety of those. <laughs> um, eutrophication is a big one. A lot of nutrients from golf courses and, and, aqua, and, and um, agriculture end up in river that then spill into the ocean. And one of the issues with those is that they stimulate strong blooms. These bloom can sink to the bottom, deplete oxygen and result in ocean kills. Oil spill, you all remember the uh, new horizon. Ghost fishing gear, uh, you might not be aware, but there's a lot of fishing gear that ends up tangled and stay on the bottom that uh, is hazardous to marine life. Uh, many of you are very interested in plastic pollution. So plastics are, are uh, a big thing that enters the ocean from land, from us, and through the air. There's a big issue of noise pollution. Um, a lot of, you know, we talked about transportation. It's, uh, it has been shown to be affecting marine mammals and their ability co to communicate between them. Um, an adverse effect that on the ocean from just uh, the issue of global climate change is we, we've noticed, and there's a paper today in science about heat waves, um, you know, uh, episodic event of very high temperature. Those are very bad for things like uh, coral reefs. Um, ocean acidification, the fact that the ocean takes CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, result in a change of pH that is detrimental to some organism. And finally, uh, it has been shown that the ocean is losing oxygen, both because it's becoming warmer and because organic matter that sinks to depth is taking it out. And that means that there's larger areas or volumes of the ocean that uh, are not supporting fisheries. Um, so where does this anthropogenic uh, pollution go? The ocean density doesn't change by much. Uh, from fresh water to very deep water where, uh, that's compressed by pressure, it only changed by 5%, which means that most, I mean, so most solid pollutants sink and some float, you know, there's some plastics float, but they don't hang up in the middle, most of them. I mean, they might hang up as on their way down, but uh, they accumulate on the bottom. We don't see them. So it doesn't, uh, it's not as much of an eyesore as it is at the surface, but it's definitely there and it will become a bigger problem with time. Another issue is uh, deep mining is becoming commercially, um, plausible and there's a big interest now in going down and getting rare earth and 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 magnesium nodal and other from the ocean so that's another source of pollution that's likely to increase as function of time uh health threats to human from the ocean there are still so, that... annual uh, a quick yeah. question for you sure. um, i mean i'm thinking about this in terms of the historic records and i know you've thought a lot about you know prior records when in the history of uh you know, human civilization and growth of technology, did we start seeing very evident clean signatures of those era in ocean pollution per se? I mean, I'm just thinking about uh, the ways, if you look back in historic records, are there from the invention of plastic to the first plastics that started showing in the ocean? Or just to know at what scale did ocean become one of the largest deposits of several of these? Is there any historic perspective? So, so when, when I was a kid, let's say, so you yeah. know, 30 years ago, the, the common approach of 34 years ago was that the, the solution for pollution is dilution. That basically we can put stuff into the ocean, the ocean's gonna take care of it. And it still is the case in many cities in the world where they pump their, including places like Vancouver, British Columbia, <laughs> where they pump their sewage into the ocean with relatively minimal treatment, assuming that tides and other things are gonna, um, mm -hmm. that's, that's which time is getting less and less so, but it's still used to a large degree as the garbage deposit of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, plastic has become really important, I don't know, five years ago, people have started to notice it in large quantities. They started to see that they can find it in, in uh, 
aquaculture, you can find it, you know, in mussels in, in, and in other things. So I think that's when people started saying, ay, 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 there's a, you know, we're starting. There are ghost um, um, things in the ocean people have seen since they started going down with submarines, you know, pieces that, of trash that humanity has thrown overboard uh, over the side. And it takes, for many things, plastic in particular, hundreds of years for the ocean to, to get rid of them. And, and mm -hmm. so, or, or for them to decay. So it's, the, what we're putting in is not disappearing. Yeah. This is partly yeah. the region, particularly in the places there's no oxygen where we can find, you know, uh, Phoenician, Phoenician boats and things like this. Marine archeology span is based on the premise that stuff does not decay fast in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think your, your perspective on the dilution makes sense because that would be the criteria that people would justify first, yeah. You want to say something? Can I add? Yeah, I guess yeah, yeah, the yeah. question, and it will come later when Emmanuel talks about the challenges of studying the ocean, is, is the lack of time series. So Emmanuel mentioned that maybe five years ago, but that's because this is when people started to look at things more mm -hmm. carefully. It doesn't mean that it was not there before. Yeah. And our ability to sample the ocean in more detail is increasing with the years, so we discover more, but we have always to keep in mind that yeah. It probably has been there longer than what we are um, having in our records, which are fairly short. Mm -hmm. so. so other health yeah. threats on the ocean, toxic algae, um, there's issues of respiratory illnesses, both in Europe and Florida, I know of cases, and fish gills associate with them when certain algae gets into the gills of fish. Um, also simply aquaculture uh, closure. Uh, the higher you are in the trophic, um, uh, level, the more you bioaccumulate toxins, and those are passed on to the next level. So if we eat mussels that are filtered out from the water, algae that have toxin in them, we risk, uh, we, we may even die from paralytic shed poisoning and, and other ones. Uh, and we talked about um, eutrophication before, so I don't need to repeat. So just a big division for people to, to how we call things because that's nomenclature is important. So we talk about benthic organism. Those are the ones that are attached to the bottom or leave on the bottom, like crabs, like algae, uh, seagrasses, certain algae, corals, kelp. So those cannot move as the situation gets worse. <laughs> and, and, but many of them do spend sometimes in the water column. column. They, they seed their seeds into the water column, which move away and then settle somewhere else. Uh, plankton are organisms that cannot significantly swim relative to ocean current. So viruses, bacteria, phytoplankton, many zooplankton and jellyfish, all those are consider plankton because while they can swim up and down, some of them even significantly, hundreds of meters a day, they do not, um, they cannot really change direction or home on a specific direction because ocean currents are much more significant than their ability to, to swim. And finally, nectar is stuff that does swim and migrate in the ocean from place to place and you know, with breeding grounds in one place to another. Just so people realize when we talk about plankton and I talk about plankton, it's mostly the stuff that gets moved by currents. Just an example of what we call now marine food web. In the marine environment, we don't talk anymore about food chains, but food webs, because there's a lot of interconnections. Um, the base of the food web, which takes its energy from the sun, are the phytoplankton. Um, those um, mostly are being eaten by uh, zooplankton, uh, tiny krill, if you will, and, and gelatinous organism that then themselves are being eaten by, by other bigger organisms. Um, like, you know, the, the, the dolphins we all like, but it can also go up uh, to polar bears and seabirds in this case, and the benthic organism as well that are part of the food chain and be eaten by, by a variety of organisms themselves. Uh, what I'll talk about afterwards is, is the fact that the, the, one of the issue with marine food webs is that the numbers concentration is very, very different as you move up. You know, there can be in a milliliter of water 10th to the 10th viruses, 10 to the 6 bacteria, 10,000 phytoplankton, maybe two zooplankton, and no single fish, obviously, in a milliliter. And then so <laughs> you have to adapt your sampling to the organisms that you're, you're interested in. The larger the organism, the more of the ocean you have to inquire from in order to be able to, to, to get information on them. 
which makes it, of course, um, very difficult. So, so some differences. Just, just yeah. on that picture, I don't know if you will get to it, but there is a very beautiful biology hidden in that picture on the ice algae. So I don't know if uh, Lee or Emmanuel, you want to say a word about it, or if it'll come later, then you can mention it later. Uh, Many people might not have heard of that term before. If you go back to the food web, yeah, these okay. Are that, so that term, uh, yeah. Well, I can say ice algae is that it, the ice is is not uh, void of life, and inside. So when sea ice forms, the salts are being rejected for, as the ice forms, and that leaves open channels where seawater can, is, is going through this channel. So those channels, special channels, they are 10 micrometer, they could be a little bit larger than that. They are full of algae and bacteria and small uh, uh, zooplankton that feed on the algae, so it's full of life. And every spring, uh, when the snow melts and the sun can go through the ice, you get a big bloom of, of sea ice uh, algae, which is serve as a, a very important food source uh, to fuel the entire ecosystem in the Arctic. But we can, if yeah. there are more questions <laughs> later, I can talk forever yeah. about it. I just <laughs> wanted you to mention it because it's just such a beautiful piece of biology. You know, you look at okay. ice and you think of it as a lifeless form. Of course, right. it's magnificent, but the fact that it itself, and again, you know, we're talking about freezing temperatures and the biology right. being adapted to it and how light couples in and how could we sample? There's lots of questions around ice by itself because who knows, maybe later on we might not have any. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, we w you can talk more about it. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're used to, and, and this is something that we have to get our mind around, we live on a two-dimensional space, and, and most of the biology we know is two-dimensional. Ocean biology is three-dimensional, which make encounter processes very different. You know, where if you want to find a mate, you don't look in two dimension; you have to find them in three dimension, which makes things more interesting in some respects. Similarly, to get rid of waste products and, and a whole variety of processes that life does, it's, it's a different channel. Again, the oceans are connected, and they're connected via currents and winds. So, the, the winds, I mean, it's been shown that winds can transfer viruses uh, from one place in the ocean to another place, uh, and even small bacteria. Um, so most of the ocean is not observed from space. What we see from space is the surface of the ocean. So most of the ocean we don't observe. It's not observed. And, but in terms of physical condition, it's less extreme than the terrestrial environment. The higher temperature are less uh, extreme, the lowest temperature are less extreme. So the seasonality, even though it's, it's strong in the ocean, it's not as extreme as in on land. It's, uh, so we, we um, yeah, I'll stop there. So how do we monitor the ocean? A lot from space, and there's a movie here that I hope I can play for you, which is uh, simply chlorophyll concentration, which is measured by looking at the color, the greenness of the ocean and looking at its, the color changes. And you, what basically what you see here is the planet breathing as season change. There's times where there's higher biomass of, of phytoplankton in the spring, and then uh, it's caught up by zooplankton that eat them, and, and there's less of them in the summer, and finally going down. And, and there's a process also of mixing up the upper ocean and convection that goes up with this process. Uh, you can see that upwelling regions where waters are brought from depth with lots of nutrients like the equatorial regions and boundary currents near have more biology in them than, than these gyre blue places in the ocean that have less uh, biomass in the surface. Uh, when you integrate with depth, it's actually not that different between many regions. These data sets exist since the 70s uh, for temperature and, and, uh, and, and uh, Later, I think 90s for wings, ocean color. So looking at the color of the ocean with, with basically cameras uh, since, the, um, since the 90s. Other things we can measure from space by looking at, uh, at changes of height of the ocean. We get in indication about currents. By looking at, 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 in variety of technologies, we can now get waves, um, surface waves in the ocean, uh, aerosols above the ocean, so we can see if aerosol brings certain nutrients to certain regions of the ocean. And inside the ocean, we can monitor uh, micro-sized particles and even some information about phytoplankton physiology by comparing fluorescence measurements coming off the ocean. We can measure chlorophyll fluorescence from space, which is unbelievable. 
uh, and, and uh, as well as the color. Um, the frontier from the perspective of biology nowadays is people putting up CubeSats with cameras using active uh, sensors like laser, shining laser into, into the atmosphere and the ocean to, to, uh, to get to and then look at the signal coming back and polarimetry. So now we're not only looking at, at the scalar radiometry, we're actually looking at, at polarization and that can allow us to better uh, separate different things that are in the water. Uh, by using so, polarization. Then Emmanuel, a few questions on the technology front. What is the current resolution at which the closed Very good question. Yeah. So, so Where is on the technology? Daily, on a daily basis, we, it's typically a kilometer, maybe down to 500 meters. We do have sensors like Landsat and, 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 and um, uh, Sentinel-2 A and B that go down to tens of meter. With Sentinel-2, we get tens of meter of color. With, with Landsat, we get 60 meter of, um, of temperature, as, uh, or 100 meter of temperature, 60 meter of color. And this is extremely useful. Um, what we've done with them in Maine, for example, is water quality to help decide where to put aquaculture um, facilities by using those sensors, which we couldn't do before because Maine has a very fjord-like um, coast. And so you cannot use the one, one kilometer is way too large for, for doing that. The other thing is people studying lake and reservoir now can have records of water quality parameters from space, which is phenomenal. It's all freely available. Uh, a lot of sharing uh, of algorithm and, and ways to clean the, 90% of the signal is atmospheric for ocean color. So you have to remove that signal and that's the whole <laughs> science in itself. We're looking, we're the, their noise and there are noise, but there are big noise in our little signal we're trying to get from, mm -hmm. from the ground. And yeah, I mean, I think offline, what would be very valuable is for students that are interested to provide a few web resources for people who want to download their own data, for example. Oh, sure, sure. It I'll would be, be fantastic to... because I know, so I think on the Teach Me Anything, it might be fun for folks to just download satellite data, which, you know, personally, I have never done in my life. I would like to learn how to, to be able to do that. Okay, back I'll, to you. I've just started. <laughs> <laughs> I have students that do most of it. <laughs> yes. So how else do, so now we talk, so we talk about surface ocean. So if you want to measure uh, properties with depth, what we use nowadays a lot are these, Argo, they're called Argo floats. They started to be used in the 90s. Uh, there's since 2000, there's a, a fleet of them. We're now up to about 3,500, 4,000 of them. All, me all measured, temperature, salinity, and pressure. So that's it. Uh, and, and going up and down every 10 days, and they profile from 2,000 meter up, and they're parked at 1,000 meter. Uh, recently, uh, we started putting biogeochemical sensors on them, like oxygen, and then even more recently, nitrate, pH, um, scattering, so we get information of particle, chlorophyll fluorescence, and, and uh, radiometers. Very recently, uh, people have started putting on them cameras that can take pictures of particles like zooplankton, uh, and that's just in trial period. Um, and those, uh, the, the beauty of this system, it's integrated. Every country puts several, but they all uh, report their data to a similar database, so you can download all of them together to get from the piece of ocean you're most interested in. Um, some of them profile even to 4,000 meters. Those are the deep Argo. There's about 150 of them now. So this is uh, September uh, 2020. Um, the sad part about them is that in terms of biology, it's extremely crude. Um, it, mm -hmm. Chlorophyll is kind of the greenness. How much green is there? In, but again, with, with smart people like you guys, um, we you hope we can do more. You, you might want to mention what's... Yeah, there is a question about cost. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so the one that does only physics costs about $20,000. The one that does biogeochemistry is $100,000 per <laughs> float, and you get out of it about 300 profiles. Yeah. So just so you know. Yeah. yeah. I think, it's I mean, very, this is, this is yeah. why I wanted this talk to be early, because I want to make sure that as people are thinking and then there are idea boards that arise after this talk, from a planetary scale, please feel free to create more idea boards around this. So, so I, another thing that is a problem, do. another thing that's a problem is that when they die, they sink to depth, which is very disturbing to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So 
the more of them there will be and the more integrated the system, the hope is in the Mediterranean now, they recycle about a third of them. And the hope is to increase the amount of recycling of these floats. So when batteries start going down, they'll stay at the surface and somebody's going to go and get them. But the ocean is extremely vast. It's, and it's very expensive to send boats to go get them, unless these are sailboats and volunteer people that are willing to go. Mm -hmm. um, these are all the assets we have that are coordinated in something called the Global Ocean Observing System. So what we have here, and this is as of one month uh, in 2016, but it's not that much different today. So it's, if there's moorings in there, there's the Argo that we just talked about, um, surface drifters that are just staying in the surface. A lot of these data is used for meteorology. Just so you know, if you know the temperature of the ocean, it's extremely useful in weather prediction, particularly on the west sides of continents. So most of this data goes every day, every time you get a measurement, straight to databases and into data simulating model that predict weather. This is why the, the physical part is so important on them, and that's why people care about it. There's also a network of moored buoys uh, called ocean sites now, and, and they are just lines in the ocean with sensors on them that collect data and send some, some of them send real-time data to shore, not all of them. And then there's oceanographic vessels, the one called Go Ship here. It's very few, but what they're able to do that none of the other can do um, is, is, I mean, now we can do a little bit on moorings in this respect, is collect water samples. So you can collect the water sample, you can filter it, you can do genetics on it, you can do much more than you can do with all these robotics. There is a push to try and roboticize the measurements of genetics and of other things. There are some systems extremely, extremely expensive, $250,000 for something that detects a harmful algal bloom organism genetically. And it can do only a few, you know, maybe 30 samples. Um, there may be yeah. a few of them. And so, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's great for citizen science. <laughs> <laughs> How do we want to do the So as I said, everything I just showed you, most of it barely measure anything that has to do with living organism. Phytoplankton's are all lumped to green color or pigment or chlorophyll. We don't know nothing about who they are, who's there in the water. With zooplankton, we have something called the continuous plankton recorder that has been used since the 40s. It's this thing on the right. It has a silk um, liner that uh, two of them that pass uh, that that filter organism and then get dipped into a poison, and then people then stretch it back in a lab in Plymouth and they count the big organism they can actually identify, and phytoplankton are again the greenness that they find there. The bigger one they can actually say it's a diatom. They have been using them in. Uh, from volunteer vessels in the North Atlantic in particular for years. Um, and the average, a sample is 18 kilometer of ocean. So the stuff is about 20 meter below the surface, 20 kilometer become one sample, but then they, uh, because that's the, that's the resolution they get. Um, and then I have to make a comment here, Emmanuel. This is yeah. amongst the ocean technologies, the plankton recorder is my favorite mm -hmm. amongst everything that I've, uh, read so far, just because of the beautiful insight of how to do this. I mean, Hardy was just uh, incredible at coming up with things like this. And again, this is, reminds everyone that it really is a spark of an idea. And then eventually the fact that it continued, the program has continued for so long. I mean, historically, once you create tools and you empower the right kind of people, then you know, Hardy is not there anymore, but the, the program has continued in a manner. I mean, it's a really remarkable example of what can be done. And, and it's really remarkable how useful it is, at least for a certain group of organisms, because yeah. now we already detect changes in the North Atlantic Ocean because there is a long enough time series and we can relay those changes to climatic changes. So yeah. um, we don't have too many long time series like, like that. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'll touch, I'll touch yeah. to it uh, in a bit. We have yeah. things. So, there is yeah. one more question on the prior side. If you go to the data slide before, yeah. you said this was the integrated view of the ocean. I'm just curious from an open science perspective, who owns this data? The data is public, but it's distributed in many different databases. So all the Argo are in one. I see. Um, the, so things that are similar, 
tend to, like surface drifter all go into one database. But this is what we call the global, the global observing system. In order to be part of it, you have to share data. Mm -hmm. um, I so that, so that's, I, yeah. The reason I ask the question is often enough in many fields, especially in medicine, there is very small amount of open data and there is an enormous amount of data that's locked in because people, and again, astronomy, unfortunately, has a little bit of that as well. So in the ocean science, what percentage of data that's been collected in the ocean in this geospatial manner is in the open domain versus how much is hidden behind? So I think in, in the last 10, 15 years, I think the majority is open domain because uh, funding agencies required it from mm -hmm. researchers. Um, when I was a student, there were people retiring with data they've never published and refused to let anybody look at, which I think is absolutely horrible. This yeah, is all taxpayer, taxpayer funded data and, yeah. and people felt like it's, they own it, which I, I, yeah. It's very nice to see that that attitude has changed. But mm -hmm. today, NSF and uh, NASA, at least for the Ocean Sciences Program, mandate that within two years, you have to make your data available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish they did that also for medicine as well. Unfortunately, that's not the case, yeah. And, and, and also as a community, people that don't share tends to be booted out in some way, you know. Yeah. People are not gonna support their, their uh, yeah. This is a way where community can control a little bit behaviors. Yeah. Um, another thing for zooplankton that exists for the, since 2010 uh, commercially is this UVP, the underwater video profiler, and there's other system, uh, I mean, that's the one commercial system I know of where you can, that takes, you put it on this package that goes up in the ocean and takes picture 18 a second. And you can, you can, you can uh, see, uh, uh, zooplankton in it and, and do size distribution of particle. And people have done nets for zooplankton for years. Um, similarly, some fisheries data is widely available, not all of it, but uh, in terms of surveys. The issue is always whether they're, they're done the same way in different countries so you can compare and whether people are hiding data so that it's, it's hard to see. Now, this is, a, this is a side issue, but people have archived samples for years. And the beauty of archiving samples is that you can then go and compare the same organism uh, from, you know, here is from the Challenger expedition with the Tara. And you can see actually that with time, the shell is changed, most likely due to ocean acidification. And that's absolutely mind boggling. And this is the importance of collecting data. Even if you don't use it, archiving, collecting data, collecting organism, as mundane as it sounds, is extremely, extremely important in biology. So just for clarity, if people didn't notice that, that the, the shell thickness is that blue line between the top and the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the cross section and you can see it's thinner and thicker. So there's a whole variety of commercial technologies, all of them, I mean, I don't think there's a single instrument here that costs less than $50,000. <laughs> so again, ripe for citizen science, but the, the point here to make is that look at the size range of what we call plankton, six orders of magnitude in size. So in volume, it's 18 order of magnitude. It's huge. And you're trying to capture all of them at the same place at the same time. Extremely tough problem to do. And, and, and not only this, the, the, the kind of back of the envelope um, or, or rule of thumb, which I hate to use because of its historical origin, is that equal biomass is, I mean, there's equal biomass in logarithmic size bin. So the same biomass exists from one to two micron, then one to two centimeter, then one to two meters. So mm -hmm. you have to scale, you have to scale your, your system and you can never have a system that is extremely wide in the size it resolves. So you have to focus and you have to try and make overlapping measurements in order to span this incredible richness of, of uh, life. This is an example of what was planned for the Tara. Tara is a French expedition. It was done on sailboat. Uh, um, um, I'm not gonna get deeper into it. You can find tons on it on the web, but they've, you, you have to change the way you filter, the way you collect data based on the organism of interest. Based on size, you collect differently, you filter them differently. 
Then in that case, they did genetics, they did imaging again with a whole variety of different technologies in order to try and span what it is. Uh, the, the beauty is it was done with a boat that, can, that had 14 people at a time, uh, only five of which were scientists. And they went around the ocean for uh, three years and afterwards through a bunch of expeditions for even longer and collecting this incredible data set that now is, it has been mined since 2000. And uh, I mean, the expedition started in 2009 and since then people have mined and, and, and continue to mine this data set of ocean life. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. So what are the problems we have with, with, with this, this life in the, most of these ocean, uh, organism cannot be cultured in the lab. So you see them in, but you don't know a lot about them. You cannot test what's going to happen to them. If it's warm, the ocean warm, if the ocean was more acidic, it's very extremely hard to know what's going to happen with them. Um, when we measure gene, we often don't know what organism they belong to. So people go and they do the soup and they get all the genes in the soup, but they don't necessarily, because many organisms have not been sequenced, they don't know which exact organism does it belong to. Um, and interaction between organisms is something that is a huge frontier in the ocean. You know, parasitism, symbiosis, mutualism. These organisms don't live in the vacuum. They live with many different other organisms and they interact. And this is a huge frontier in terms of knowing uh, science-wise how what, what, what they provide each other in terms of services. Um, so what do we do with these measurements? These measurements, you'll be surprised, are used for things like IPCC, IPCC model for IPCC, um, to, to try and constrain the role of the ocean uh, in, in, uh, in climate. Uh, people use them for anything also, individual-based model, fish interacting with zooplankton and other things. Um, when you try to assess contribution of ecological uh, processes to predict how the ocean will respond to climate change, in particular, what we call the biological pump. Biological pump is, is the role of biology in taking atmospheric CO2 and sending it to the deep ocean. The more of it will happen, the, the better it will mitigate uh, climate change. So this is an, a very, very active area of research. And, Emmanuel, I want yeah. to ask a, kind of a trick question here. And again, this can be a, your personal opinion as well. From the IPCC perspective, because, you know, in the end, we have to make models, we have to make predictions. We do with what we have, you know, so that we fill the gaps with mathematical insights. So I'm just curious, has the IPCC or these organizations created a list of most wanted? What, where are the most wanted parameters? You know, if you imagine that you have a dream of I could only measure this, my mathematical models for climate change would improve significantly. I mean, I've read this from a carbon budget perspective and of course the sinking and the sinking rates and the flux in the biological pump is a big most wanted. But I'm also curious, you know, instead of the many modelers of the opinion of we build models based on what we have, the feedback going from the modelers to the experimentalists, is there a list of most wanted parameters? Because then as tool makers, we can imagine targeting those specific measurements. So, so it, it is a trick question. Yeah, that's why <laughs> so, I asked. So um, you, you, have, you have models now that go down to groups level of phytoplankton in particular in the ocean, and they're unconstrained because there are no measurements to constrain them. They do beautiful patterns, you know, like the Darwin model from, from Darwin model from MIT. Yeah. Beautiful pictures of blooming organism and succession. We don't have the data to constrain them. And the, the loss terms are almost always parameterized to give you the right chlorophyll. So they're not based on observation of zooplankton or observation of virus uh, events in the ocean. They really are parameterized based on, okay, what do I need to tune to get the right chlorophyll? as I observe it from space. So we're, we're very far from, having, from being closed. In terms of, I mean, obviously, when modelers would want the more data, uh, the, the, more, the more we can get, but we're extremely, extremely limited. That's all I can say from, from my yeah. perspective. Yeah, and then there was a question again, I think a clarification on if you could just repeat what a biological pump is. So biological I pump is, is and, there, and there's, several of them. There's the sinking pump, which is simply organic material that sticks to each other in the surface ocean and sink. There's feeding by organism that then poop 
and their poop goes down to depth. It's, it's anything, and migration by zooplankton. Zooplankton migrate thousands of meters, five, 500 to 1,000 meters every day to the surface and back down. And in the process, carbon is taken and is ejected down at depth. And, and that process takes organic carbon and inject it in part of the ocean where it's not going to be exposed back to the atmosphere next year. And, and from the perspective of climate change, this is a way to store CO2 that we're pumping into the atmosphere down at depth and hopefully, um, yeah, not, not exposing it to the atmosphere for a few hundred or few thousand years so that it, it helps mitigate the effect of climate change. And, and then in the so next currently, time, currently, Tuesday, the ocean, is yeah, we, will, we will cover the technology aspect of this. So on Tuesday, many of these things will come about again when we talk about what technologies we have and what is needed to measure. And I think, so we'll talk a lot more about biological pump on the next class too. Okay. Um, so, and the other problem is having a baseline, as we talked before, and it, it will come back and back. The problem is to, if you want to evaluate if the ocean is changing, you have to, you have to monitor a change. And if you don't have a baseline, you don't know who's there to start with, you can't evaluate whether it's changing in terms of the biology. Uh, and that, so that's extremely important. Are the species composition changing, all that stuff. So what are the problems? The problems are we have chronic undersampling. The technology is extremely expensive. And there's also an issue of lack of standardization of method. So the last one has been tackled recently by an organization called the Ocean Best Practices. You can go online and there's now videos and there's a whole bunch of um, manuals and reports on how to do specific measurements to try and ensure we all do them in a similar way. We're all aware of what we do so we can compare them across the world and across communities. Uh, that's extremely important. Um, some potential solution, as, as we talked about, given that half the humanity lives within 200 miles of the coast, ocean plankton sampling is ripe for citizen science. Additionally, if we uh, rope in the sailing community, the commercial fleet, including cruise boats, and give them a sense that they help the understanding of the ocean, that can help a lot. And there are already some, uh, the, the, as we talked about, the continuous plankton recorder, it is um, used on with commercial fleet and there are several um uh how do you call them ferries that also make measurements and what we what i hope is that every one of these boats is pumping water to cool its engine to do a whole variety of other things and we if we could tap to this cooling system to this pumping water system and if these systems were clean enough we could use them also to monitor with instruments that are not in the water that are on the boat they're not slowing the boat down what's happening in the water who's there and I'm going to pass it to Lee. Oh, okay. Now, uh, <laughs> Manu, how are we doing with respect to time? We have 20 minutes about. We are doing very well. I think okay. you have 25, uh, even 30 minutes if we go down. Oh, ah, okay. No, I, will yeah, I think probably will not take. I will probably will not take this, so it will leave time for questions. Yeah. I think um, I definitely want to have some questions on the Arctic community itself because. That's okay. A yeah. I mean. Really, perspective. Yeah. yeah. So um, we thought that. We will now just focus on one ecosystem, one uh, ecosystem, which is the Arctic. Um, and I, I found this cartoon online that uh, human health is in the center and these are the different ecosystem services that are, are provided. Um, I always find it kind of uh, interesting that the humans are somehow always in the center. Um, and, <laughs> and then, um, and then Ecosystems under stressors, different stressors, uh, and Emmanuel have mentioned uh, already some, like um, ocean acidification, extreme weather, rising temperature, pollutants, and so on. But when we think about the ocean, or I would think of any ecosystem, is what is the health of the what is health of ecosystem? How do we measure it? How do we determine it? Often it's come from a very human centric, you know, if it provides the services that we look for, it's a good health. If not, we have to worry, but what really is, uh, so, but there are some indicators and, and when you get sick or you suspect that you are getting sick, what, what do you do to measure your health? The first, one of the first thing that you do to measure your health. Anyone, just <laughs> in chat. 
I cannot see the chat. So no. Take the temperature. Okay, good. That's uh, what I was hoping I will get. So, uh, so just before we take the temperature, so let, we will take the temperature of the ocean, but before we do that, um, I just want to say why the Arctic. And really the Arctic is one of the last pristine ecosystems on earth. And it's a very unique place. It's an, a, and a mosaic of landscape, organisms, community, and cultures that really live in harmony in many ways, but getting a lot of influences from lower latitudes um, with a lot of unintended consequences. Um, and these are all photos that uh, Emmanuel, me, and colleagues uh, were fortunate to collect a different uh, trip to, uh, to different communities in the Arctic. Um, so let's take the temperature of the, of, uh, the surface uh, water um, in the Arctic. And what you have here on this um, figure is the x-axis is temperature, the y is the, uh, is the year, and the y-axis is the temperature anomaly. So we are looking at the change relative to an, ever, to an average. That's what we refer as an anomaly. So here the average is taking the average of temperature between 1971 to 2000, and for each year, looking at how different it is from the average. And what you can see here is that starting in the 18s, every year, the temperature uh, anomaly is positive. So it's, it's higher than the average and it continues to increase. So this is one indicator already that the, 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 the ecosystem has fever, right? Um, mm -hmm. The other thing about the Arctic is if you look, we, and you probably all heard about it and read about it, um, but uh, sea ice, which is a unique feature to the Arctic um, and, and, and controls uh, that ecosystem in, on many levels, both the physics, the chemistry, and the biology of, and obviously the human dimension of the Arctic is um, centered around the sea ice. Um, so again, what you see here in this figure is the, sea, the change in sea, the anomaly in sea ice volume as a function of year on the x-axis. And this is again an uh, anomaly. Um, I don't, the, uh, the relative to the, uh, so you take the, it's the average of uh, 1979 to 2019. And again, you see a large decrease in sea ice volume over time. So the Arctic is warming, and losing its uh, sea ice. And you guys are probably, according to predictions, you guys are probably the last generation to see, see summer sea ice in the Arctic because the prediction says that by mid-century, there will be no more summer sea ice in the Arctic. And yeah, what happened? That's a very humbling and a sad realization. I know, I, I'm sorry, but, uh, <laughs> but that's kind of to give the drive, right? <laughs> I think it needs to settle in our mind of what we are about to face. Um, so, um, yeah, but what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. The Arctic is linked to uh, the global uh, Earth system and has a, a huge impact on, on global Earth system. And, and one of the reasons is because the, the, the sea ice and the glacier, so the, the cryosphere in the Arctic, um, has an important effect of the incoming solar radiation. It, snow and ice reflects the eye, have high albedo, um, basically prevents warming. Um, but as this cap of sea ice in both poles, not just in the Arctic, uh, melts, more ocean area and land area are being exposed, which have, lower, which have lower albedo and absorb more heat. So that facilitates further heating. So this is what we call a positive um, feedback, where you have warming, there is a reduction in Arctic sea ice, then the ocean absorbs and the land absorb more heat, you get further warming, more, sea ice and you have this snowball that starts to roll um, and kind of get out of control. And this effect, th this effect 
climate globally, not just in the Arctic. Um, so, but if we just focus now on the Arctic itself, just uh, that, that region, the list of challenges that the Arctic is and the communities that live there are facing is very long. I just highlighted a few, but it's a really long list. And, and that includes obviously with the loss of sea ice, the habitats um, for subsistence food and, and cultural activities are being lost. We talked about this, the, the, the sea ice algae, uh, but many marine organisms, especially um, high trophic uh, top predators like the polar bears, the, the seals, um, um, the wolvuses that are an important source of food for communities there, um, their, their habitat is, is slowly disappear. Um, so on top of the just loss of habitat, warming and freshening of the ocean will change marine food webs and the structure and the composition of those food webs. And it will apply from the plankton to the top predator, predators. Um, loss of sea ice. Also the sea ice protect coastal environments from storms. Uh, and, and, and erosion and loss of sea ice. And we already see it now in many communities of, of uh, coastal erosion is a, and combined with the thawing of the permafrost is a major concern and issue, already uh, ongoing issue in, in the Arctic. Um, the, the, both coastal erosion and um, there are issue the climate change that the Arctic experience have issues with water quality. I will give you an example uh, in in a second, and pollution. I will talk about it in a second. And the Arctic has been very protected because pro protected so far because the sea ice prevented uh, lots of exploration and exploitation. But with the decrease in sea ice cover. Um, first, shipping routes will increase because it really shortened the way between Asia and North America. Um, so there are already many discussions about uh, um, ship lanes and through the northeast and northwest passage. But also the Arctic is thought to uh, contain about 13% of the untapped oil reserves and about 30% of the natural gas reserves. So obviously there is a lot of interest once it's possible to drill in tapping those resources. So that's not going on yet, but it's already in discussion. Um, but also for, the, for communities in the Arctic, there are opportunities. Some in Greenland, there are people already starting to see increase in, in fish abundances and fisheries because of warming. Not everything has a negative effect. So for the local economy, fisheries might be more, um, becoming more important as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as the economy. And there are other economic, economic development, tourism, which has its both benefits and, 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 and uh, brings other potential problem, but it's not all just black or white. Uh, and, and we have, but, but the question is, how do we um, harness the opportunities and meet the challenges, right, together? Mm -hmm. So, um, so now, very recently, this month, uh, we just learned that we got a new program from NSF, which is NRT. N NSF has uh, large programs for graduates for training the new workforce. Uh, and it's a research training ship for graduate students. We put a proposal to focus on the Arctic. We call our program SAUNA, which stands for System Approaches to Understanding and Navigating the New Arctic. We don't have a logo yet because it's new. We will have a logo soon. Um, but the, the approach that we are taking is actually, although both Emmanuel and I are oceanographers and here we are focusing on the ocean, is a system approach. The, the ocean is not isolated from the cryosphere in the Arctic and from the terrestrial system in, in the Arctic. So we put together a team that actually look at those interfaces between the changes in, in uh, terrestrial system, the ocean, and the cryosphere in the Arctic. Um, 
and how they feed each other. And three of the main goals, there are many goals to it, but that I thought that are relevant here is to advance understanding of Arctic and subarctic changes. So Maine is part of the subarctic. Uh, it's a gradient that you are basically looking at from moving into effects of climate change on subarctic community all the way to Arctic communities and their local and global effects. Conduct solution driven research that fo focus on socio environmental system and their dynamics and how we can use it to inform Arctic policy. And the third idea, this is only a five year program, is to develop a successful model that can be implemented and continue to um, be used by many different programs um, in different places. So the two big questions that we are really, so, as, so it's, a, it's a graduate program, but we have research components into it. And the two big questions that we are focusing on are how do Arctic system interact with local and broad scale socioeconomical changes in northern latitude? And how, do we, and how do we use this information to inform policy and management innovations to improve outcomes of a very, very dynamic system? So these are very broad questions. I'll, and I'll give you three examples of more specific research questions that we are going to tackle. And this is where I think frugal science could become extremely helpful. Um, and the setting that we chose to focus is Southwest Greenland and North Atlantic and Maine, but now I will just talk on Southwest Greenland. And then Lee, um, just as a, to understand the scale, since you're showing the map, uh, how should folks think about the population? What is the scale of human population in these regions? So in all, Greenland, all Greenland is about 40,000 people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with a lot of, so one of the, I, I talked one from a researcher with Nook, and one of the challenges that they have, but it's a huge area. If you want to yeah. monitor and understand the environment, they don't have the manpower, nor the resources of it, although Denmark you know, provides. Uh, but if you can come with simple solutions that do, that do not involve a lot of manpower, that are cheap and you can, robust. and robust, yeah. you know, you can, um, that will be extremely... Um, yeah, I mean, just if you think about a tiny portion of Mexico City would have more people. But um, so then information becomes very hard to reach out to people too. You know, programs right. have challenges in implementation with this dilution effect. But that's exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. But yet it's a very critical system, right? It's maybe not a lot of people locally, but it has a... a a global impact yeah. in terms of, um, and to follow up on what you just said, it's a very difficult, um, so this is, the re this is the region. So it's really this, um, how do I, do you see my cursor? Yeah. So this yeah. is really the tip, th this is the southern tip of Greenland. The area that we focus uh, on is called Kujata. And you can see just a system of fjords with very tiny communities, and those communities can be like three families, um, <laughs> and a few larger cities, Town. towns, yeah, towns, um, <laughs> not cities, <laughs> it's towns, uh, but all these dotted, but this region is uh, in 2017, all the Kujata area, so this is where Eric the Red and his Viking friends came to Greenland and start, started to establish those farming communities. So in 2017, uh, this region became um, a UNESCO uh, national uh, uh, heritage, UNESCO heritage uh, site. So there is a, a big interest from the local community in the preservation. Actually, they are bound because they became a, a UNESCO. Um, heritage site, they are bound for the preservation of this uh, area, um, yeah, um, mm -hmm. as part of the, for this heritage, heritage uh, center. 
So what you talk about communication, you're right. So most of the communication is done via boats uh, in, in, in the summer, going to the fjords. In the winter, they use the skidoos and the, and the trucks to ride on the, on the ice. But already there, the past few summers did not have thick enough ice to, commun to commute. So communication becomes even more, one of the consequences is that they, co these little communities be are becoming very isolated in the winter because riding in the, on the ice becoming less and less safe. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that's uh, the area and it's very interesting area because it's where you see both the Old Norse and the Inuit substance uh, practices co occur together. And what I mean by that is that the Norse practices are, are, are sheep farming. So there are all those little communities, those little, yeah, are basically few families sheep farms. And then um, this is a, a photo that from Narsak, you can see the, the uh, members of the Inuit community. Uh, these are the seals that they are um, just harvested and, and they were skinning them on, on, on the shore. And uh, so, mo so most, so these are farmers and then most of the uh, substance food for the Inuit is still coming from the sea. And this is where land and sea um, interact in, in, a, in a fairly sh small um, region. And Lee, for background, could you just say very briefly about the two words, Norse and Inuit, just, you know, how do we differentiate these as communities and what does So the Norse are more the Scandinavians uh, and those are the descendant of Eric the Red. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So Vikings, ex-Vikings. Um, mm -hmm. And the Inuit are the local communities that um, have been there. They were there when Eric the Red, uh, Red arrived. There I are see. many different, yeah, so they have been there for, I don't know. Much longer. Uh, yeah, much longer. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the, in, but, but in, the, in this part, they, they, they live, both communities are, are um, live sharing the same habitat. As you go north in Greenland, it's, it's only Inuit. And mm -hmm. Danes, obviously Danes that came to the cities and, and you see a strong Danish influence, obviously, in, in Greenland, um, because Greenland belongs to Denmark. Yeah, um, so, so I'll give you examples of three projects that we are going to focus, and this is where I, 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 I think frugal science will become important. So the, fresh, the, the, the first thing is, is looking at effects of uh, climate change on freshwater resources. As I told you, uh, these are farming communities, and in the past few summers, what they, what they experience is very dry summer, summers. And these summers are really critical for the irrigation and the grass that they grow for the sheep. So they are already talking about putting irrigation, the need for irrigation system, which means tapping into the small ponds and lakes uh, in the region to get ir irrigation which implies changing hydrology of, of the area. And um, when you change hydrology, especially in a place like the Arctic with the permafrost, um, the release of uh, um, methane and other uh, gases becoming a real, a real in issue. So one of the projects is to work with those farmers and um, monitor both the pond and lakes and possibility for irrigation, you know, without assessing all the, but again, no baseline. We visited mm -hmm. there in 2019 and there's just like no baseline information, no measurements, no measurement of water quality in the lakes, soils, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the other project is, um, so if we go back to the map, you see these communities and there are all these glaciers that are going into the fjords and the, uh, the way uh, glaciers interact with fjords, when a glacier um, comes into the ocean, it brings it with, with it a lot of sediments, but also a lot of nutrients. And that affects the productivity that Emmanuel showed you before with the, the satellite colors, you know, the phytoplankton production, which sustain the entire ecosystem. This, these glaciers are retreating. 
And when you, when you uh, go in South Greenland, you, you see many cases like this, where you see that already the, the glacier is retreating and the, the land is exposed. That alters the whole dynamics of the fjords and affect those, the marine ecosystem and the structure of the food web in these marine ecosystems. Again, no baseline measurements in this fjord. Um, and I want just to show you an example of what does it look like when a fjord is melting. And when the, uh, well, not when a fjord, when a, when a glacier is melting. And this is a tiny glacier in Greenland in the summer. Look at the amount of water that is being discharged into the, into the, the fjord. Um, so we also know that um, those, because, because of the position of Greenland, a lot of pollutants from lower latitude are being carried and deposited as snow on the, on the Greenland glaciers. So as those glaciers melt, these pollutants, which mercury is a huge issue in the Arctic, but other pesticides and plastics and, and many different other pollutants um, are being released into the water sources, both freshwater and marine. Um, but again, there's no, for that region, there's no baseline information. So basic monitoring is really critical uh, for water quality is very critical in this area. So Leah, and, quick question on yeah. mercury side. What is the route of mercury getting there at the first place? Is that atmospheric or? Yeah, part of it is atmospheric, yeah. I see. So, but atmospheric and ocean currents and, um, but or atmospheric is it, deposition is, yeah. Is it older <laughs> deposition of mercury that was now getting unlocked? Some of it, yeah. It, but there's also, I mean, yeah. people don't realize, but in Maine, we're advised against eating fish from pristine lakes because of atmospheric deposition of mercury and it's bioaccumulation in fish. It's crazy. And, and Maine actually was one of the states that, that, that sued uh, uh, Ohio and you know, uh, power plants because it's because how the atmospheric circulation on our mm -hmm. globe is, is uh, in, in the Arctic particularly is very important because mercury is bioaccumulates along the trophic chain. Yeah. So when, when you, your, most of your food is from higher predators, they had the chance to accumulate. So when you feed on polar bears, on whales, on seals, they bioaccumulated a lot of merc mercury. Mm -hmm. And there have been always, there have been communities, when we talk about health, there have been some Arctic communities where the mothers were advised not to nurse the kids because of the high level of mercury that they found in, in the mothers in breast milk. Mm -hmm. So mercury is a huge issue in the Arctic. Yeah, um, I think it would be valuable if some of the folks listening, if we could create an idea board around mercury itself, you know, low way, cost ways of measuring mercury, both yeah. in human and environmental context would be a very valuable thread coming out of this. Yeah, and um, and the last slide is just to give you an idea. So this is a little. This uh, we worked with an outfitters that took us to because we went there to do a little um, exploration, scouting. scouting about what are the issues, what are the problem, how do we work with the. So this is one of the outfitters. But if we were to work in those glaciers and those lakes, this this will be the conditions. These are the tents. There is no power. There is a Wi-Fi sign, but no real Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> So it's like a, a lunar landscape, no power, no. no so, but, but we want to get a baseline to monitor the fjord, to monitor the lakes for water quality. Um, and, but that's kind of the conditions that um, one would work in. So I will end up here and leave it to your imagination now. <laughs> so if you unshare your screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, what we will do is in the five minutes remaining, I think we could do two things. Uh, we could take some questions around the, uh, the Arctic itself and just overall what you all heard. Uh, but I think since the Tuesday class will primarily be, uh, I forgot to mention this, I should have mentioned this, that today was really about grappling the problem. So if you're feeling depressed, 
uh, welcome to the club. <laughs> it's important for all of us to feel this way because if we don't feel this way, we will never have empathy for these problems. So this was by design that we want to highlight these large scale problems. And you know, we are all small in that perspective. I want to end on a positive note and then this would be the prelude to the discussions we will have next week on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, where we will talk a lot more about both the technologies that are coming in and into this place and also thinking a lot about how much space there is for innovators like all of us to actually provide technologies. Because I mean, this is truly an untapped health. Human health is a very important space to work in. And of course we will, in the next set of class, when we jump from ocean to terrestrial ecosystems in the last case study, we will talk quite a lot about that. But I wanna spend this moment to just have us appreciate that because of the way industries work, there is a lot more infrastructure and research resources dedicated to improving human health. Mm -hmm. But that type of industry does not exist for planetary health or planetary monitoring. And these are just outcomes, you know, satellites came out of espionages and I'll actually talk about satellites for 10 seconds now. But it's very important to understand that technology development in that space can have a huge impact on the longer run. And uh, so I think I just want to show something a uh, little bit on the positive side of the story uh, just to close. And we will we'll talk about satellites for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that I wanted to bring about here as a transition between as Lee and Emmanuel and many others, uh, there are several mentors in the class uh, who are really experts in oceanography. So even after listening to this, if you're inspired to create a new idea board, please feel free to, you know, the, the goal of creating these problem sets is that you understand uh, that these problems need to be tackled. Uh, but I wanna give you a historic perspective about this and leave a little bit on a positive note as well. So the picture that you're seeing on the right is a, a very famous picture and in the chat, maybe some of you have already identified it. Uh, do people know what they are looking at on the right? Uh, I can't see my chat, so I'm gonna try to see if I can see my chat. Let's see. Yeah, I think they all got it. Okay, they all got it, perfect. So let me go back to the picture. Um, the important aspect of this is associated with uh, the history of what is called uh, Operation Moonwatch. Oh, and I have my kids in here. Just give me one second. I'll be back in two minutes. <laughs> That's what happens when we teach at home. Uh, they all, they wanted everybody to know that they took a shower for real. So I'll just repeat that. <laughs> okay. So going back to this picture, this is a very famous picture because when the Russians launched Sputnik, there was something very interesting happened. There was a panic across because we were not anticipating the age of satellites. And of course, the Russians said that there is a satellite in space. And now how do you believe it? Of course, it was pinging a beeping. So with, if you had any radio equipment, you could kind of hear the ping. But what if you launch a satellite that is not pinging? And what if the Russians had launched 50 satellites and not just one? How would you know what is out in space? And on the very left is Fred Whipple. He was a very famous astronomer. He was the head of Smithsonian. And he had been anticipating this problem for a long while. Uh, and of course, the newspapers had these uh, headlines like the Reds launched this and the Reds launched that. And he started what is still known today to be the world's oldest citizen science program. He started it in 1956 around this time. It's called Operation Moonwatch. And the idea is very profound. He realized at that time that it is the, the space around us is so vast that you need a lot of observers. And on the other hand, the defense enterprise had been investing on technologies to do automated scanning of the space. And we did not have that technology 15 years after the first satellites were launched. And Operation Moonwatch became the very first large scale citizen science program. And he shipped tens of thousands of very simple telescopes to citizens around the world. 
And, you know, one of the phenomenal aspects is these are kids in Philippines, South Africa. This is, I love the subtitle of this picture. I put it from a newspaper. It says, Mrs. Lloyd Eisenhower, housewife, volunteer, sought Sputnik II. And literally, it's these individuals that were the first one to spot Sputnik 1, 2. There were many of them launched. And then they would report the spottings to the defense. And then the army telescopes would start pointing in this way. This was the global network for the next 15 years that collected the largest astronomical data in this sense that has ever been collected by a global collection of citizens. And they were better than every technology that came about for 15 years until the automated technology took over. So what I find quite profound in this insight was of course, uh, there was a fairly simple device, but there was a lot of methodology. So all of them are sitting, for example, at a known distance from each other, because what they are doing, for example, if you look in this picture in South Africa to the very left, they are given a specific quadrant in the sky to observe for X period of time. And then one person, when they observe, they all are wired together with a little Morse code and they measure when a particle enters their trajectory and when it leaves. And they do that in cause consecutive quadrants. And from that, they back calculate the actual trajectory. And then the next day, that data in the night is shipped to IBM and they had their mechanical computers crunching that data. And then the next day they were told where to look based on our mathematical models. And then once you've built it a couple of times, then you can build prediction in the trajectory of a satellite and then you know exactly where to look and you've marked it. So this was the operation. And I think one of the, I looked on eBay and I was able to find a version. This is the actual instrument. And I know there is a big team of people who are ramping up on doing, uh, you know, we have an idea board on building telescopes. So we will look at this design very carefully because Fred Whipple literally manufactured this. But it's an important lesson to learn because it's not just about the device. What Fred built was a community and he built a methodology of collecting quantitative data. So as we are thinking about this, you know, he went from, there was this instrument that would collect all of these radio clicks, the Morse code clicks that the observers are making and send that back to a central station such that the next day you could do. So as we are thinking about this, I wanna end at this note because it happened to be both the world's largest and the longest running citizen science program and this is what has inspired astronomy to really take on citizen science as the first field in science is astronomy is when citizens are making observations of supernovas, for example, the only supernova that has ever been observed directly was by a citizen scientist in Australia trying to test his new camera. And he acts, I mean, it's a very rare event, but he accidentally pointed it to something extremely important. And of course, many of you have seen the impacts on Jupiter and many of these observations are first made by citizen scientists and then relayed back. So I wanna share this vision. This is a beautiful book you can all find, Operation Moonwatch. And as we build, and I think the lesson here is, as we look at these problems and we look at the human resources that we have, we have to remember we're not just making tools, we are trying to build communities and the glue between them for it to actually be a solution that's relevant. So I'll leave it at that. And the thread we will follow in the next week's class. Uh, if people can find this book, you should read it. It really is worth it. Uh, we will transition to technologies and we will talk about a few technologies, but we will also talk about how citizen science can play a significant role in enhancing these technologies to be enhanced of far greater number of people and especially the kind of people that are being impacted the most. I think that part is often lost in this situation where, of course, when you will make technologies for frugal science, they will be adopted by academics like me and Emmanuel very quickly because we have very tight budgets. But in the end, we are very finite group of people are studying the Arctic, as Lee pointed out. And what we have to do is to essentially design for folks that live with these situations and their lives would be impacted both in positive and negative ways. So this is your client as you're thinking about. So I wanna end at that note. Uh, 
we will pick this thread again. And then I'm hoping Lee and Emmanuel, if you're free on Tuesday, uh, we'll kind of catch up on that thread. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, for running the session. And I have to apologize, I'm always last minute. So the fact that Emmanuel took on this challenge, I'm only thinking a week ahead of what we are going to be doing next week. So on that note, we will say bye. Uh, and try to real quick. Logistics. Go ahead, Lee, and then Tyler. Go ahead, Lee. Think about the, also the relation to citizen science, especially in the context of the Arctic. When we go there to do research, we come for two weeks um, a year, maybe. Yeah. This is not <laughs> monitoring the system, right? You need to to be to have a presence there all the time, and we cannot do it. It's only yeah. the people who live there can yeah. do it, and, and the people who can tolerate that temperature. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Tyler, let's just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And then, yeah, perfect. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Um, just very quick logistically, if you have not yet joined a team yet, do take a look at the idea board. Um, and then one assignment, if you have joined a team would be uh, all the teams that have names listed should currently have a channel on discord. So the assignment for, for that would just be introduce yourself to your team. And if you guys can coordinate, it would be good to just start, discussing because I think this is going to be the start of, of how these are going to work out. Yeah, and I think I would emphasize on this that uh, the second team meeting, me and mentors will join your second meeting, but the first meeting should be about getting to know each other because if you don't know your team partners, I don't think you're making any progress. So do that first meeting as soon as possible, depending on whatever time frames. Don't wait for us. Now we are off to the races. Uh, and then the other part is every idea board, every team should have a unique name, like a short code name, whatever you want to call yourself, because we will be referring to these code names as a quick way. And the more memorable the code name is, uh, uh, as long as it's appropriate, uh, please come up with a code name that you can use uh, in terms of just describing uh, the project without describing it completely. And, and you can post that in the Discord chat that's been, that's been given for you. Um, the, uh, yeah, specifically with that, I think it would be great if you guys, if you're in a team, if you can meet um, as soon as possible before next class, because I know some people are still shopping around for ideas. Um, so if you're one of those people that's shopping, look at the, I'm looking for a team channel uh, for all that and the idea boards. Um, and if you're currently on multiple teams, same deal. So meet with those people and then end up, uh, with just one team, if possible. Mm -hmm. All right. That was amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everybody. And thank you, Emmanuel and Lee. This was phenomenal. Uh, we are now ready for the challenge. <laughs> Bye, everybody.